Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I want to welcome the 200 registered participants from over 60 countries to the 2020 Africa Virtual Think Tank Summit. The theme of this summit is think tanks and policy advice in a world disrupted and transformed. First, I would like to thank my research interns on whose shoulders I stand. As many of you know, the TTCSP operates without the benefit of a budget or full-time staff. So I depend heavily on a uh, army of re volunteer research interns. I would also want to thank the uh, TTCSP International Planning Committee and the Africa Summit Planning Committee, whose willingness uh, is demonstrable evidence that the international uh, international cooperation is alive and well, and the global community of think tanks has been realized. I want to thank the panels and the chairs for taking the time to share their recommendations and strategies for how we can best respond to the crisis so that we can help save lives and livelihoods in countries throughout Africa. As many of you know, the summit is conducted in a virtual roundtable format, which makes it impossible for all participants to have the opportunity to contribute. We do, however, encourage all participants to post their questions and comments on the chat function. We will reflect those questions and comments in the summit report. The summit is divided into five segments. The opening panel, the invisible black swan, how COVID-19 has changed the world, is intended to provide a status report on the pandemic and its impact from every, um, uh, from every sub region in Africa, um, nine months into the crisis and seven months after the TTCSP and its global think tank partners launched the global think tank town hall meeting to save lives and livelihoods, where over 1,226 policymakers, journalists, think tank executives, and scholars actively participated in three global town hall meetings to save lives and livelihoods. The second panel is intended to follow the initial panel in terms of laying out the key uh, status report on the region. Uh, and the second panel, the panel uh, entitled Mandate for Ideas and Action in the Face of a Pandemic, Twindemic or Hydrodemic, is intended to provide specific strategies and programs and best practices to address the social, public health, political, and economic impact of the crisis. The third panel, the COVID-19, the accelerator, transformer, or terminator, what think tanks must do to survive and thrive in a world disrupted, focuses on how think tanks need to be smarter, better, faster, more digital, and more agile as a result of this crisis. Many think tanks in Africa, and we have looked at this since 2015, are uh, face challenges of sustainability, which are only accelerated and made more difficult as a result of this crisis. And so the intent here is to come together as a community of think tanks and to help one another survive this crisis so that we can continue to serve uh, the citizens and policymakers in the countries where we are located. The, <laughs> the next panel is how to get ahead of the crisis. Um, and that is uh, focuses on a specific um, approach to how to manage the crisis um, and to provide um, uh, the necessary um, response. And the and in the uh, like the plague in the Middle Ages uh, that led to the re Renaissance um, in Europe and uh, uh, after the the plague, 
the uh, speculation is because of the disruptions, because of the failure of systems, that there will be a need um, for a rethinking and renaissance, hopefully ushered in, um, in regions and countries around the world. Um, the empirical evidence is that in each and every period where there was a global, uh, regional or national disruption and a failure of institutions to respond effectively to the crisis, a new set of institutions uh, were ushered in. And similarly, uh, that is likely to occur as a result of COVID-19. The final panel um, is making T20 fit for an uncertain future. As all of you know, um, in every T20 and G20 summit, Africa is on the agenda, at least for the T20. It has never really fully been realized uh, within uh, the G20 and uh, communique. Uh, and unlike Europe, the EU with 27 countries has representation on the T20, but Africa with 54 countries is not represented and is only represented by a single country, South Africa, uh, on the T20. I firmly believe that the challenge of the, of the, of the uh, G20 and T20 is not only to talk the talk, but to walk the walk and make sure that it is inclusive, transparent, and democratic. And the final panel will report out on the efforts to uh, make the G20 and T20 more inclusive, and will issue a call from Italy to you to help reform and help make the T20 um, more inclusive and responsive and policy relevant. And we look forward, uh, and certainly Italy um, and uh, India look forward to your engagement uh, in the process. And so without further ado, I turn the, the um, opening session uh, that will assess the impact of COVID on Africa um, to um, Dijan Dubema, who is the um, director of the Africa program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Um, I want to point out that we have, um, in each and every one of these summits, looked to engage um, think tanks outside the area. Uh, I have for a number of years been um, attempting to engage think tanks in the U.S. and Europe to have them re-engage and connect uh, in, a, uh, in a direct way with many institutions. They are already doing that, uh, but we wanted to make sure that in this forum that they are represented um, and are uh, a part of this effort. And I want to thank um, Center for Strategic and International Studies, Brookings, uh, Carnegie Endowment, the Wilson Center, um, ISPE, uh, Chatham House, uh, Real Alcano, uh, and other uh, Foundation Alternativos, um, who are actively involved uh, in the global summits and regional summits and are here today to show their support for think tanks in Africa and to build in this critical time partnerships. Judd, I turn it over to you. Jim, thank you so much. It's an honor to be here uh, to talk about this important uh, topic, as well as, you know, I share uh, your mission in terms of partnership with our fellow African think tanks and uh, look forward to interacting with many of you, many of you either uh, in today's session or, or offline. Um, so today we're going to talk about the invisible black swan, how COVID-19 changed the world. You know, COVID-19 is an economic political and security crisis as much as it is a public health crisis. I'd also say it's a geopolitical challenge, but that becomes a mouthful, right? We know that 200, 2 million people have been infected uh, with the disease. Uh, we know that there, the continent is entering a recession. But I think today's panel, we want to talk about some of these dismal effects, but also perhaps some of the unspoken or unfocused on positive effects. And so I'm gonna give you just a rundown of some ideas on negative and positive effects uh, beyond the public health crisis, because I think that gets a lot of the oxygen and beyond the economic crisis, because again, I think our panelists will mention it, but 
a couple of months ago, I wrote an article for the Mail and Guardian with Simon Allison, and we tried to sort of enumerate some of the things that perhaps are going under the radar. So in the negative column, we have seen an increase in xenophobia. That's not only against Chinese in Africa, but Africa, Africans in China, but also against expats uh, that live on the continent from Europe or America or, or wear blue helmets as part of the UN, um, or against specific groups that often are discriminated within, within countries like Somalis and South Africa. Uh, we've seen more and more cases of corruption uh, from Uganda to Zambia to Zimbabwe to Nigeria associated with COVID-19. We have seen the insurgencies and the militants and terrorist groups able to exploit the pandemic, particularly in places like Northern Mozambique, the Sahel and Chad. Um, while in other places in the world, extremist groups are taking a knee, uh, practicing social distancing, that has not been the case in Sub-Saharan Africa. And then of course, we've seen democratic backsliding during this period. Several governments have used the excuse of COVID-19 to delay elections. Other governments have decided to move forward with their elections with the hopes that their opponents, their opponent supporters won't be able to get to the polls or that um, international observers won't attend. On the positive side, and again, I think this doesn't get a lot of attention, we have probably seen the most significant expansion of welfare states uh, and social safety nets in Africa since the early independence period with uh, health insurance, with, with new business loans, with um, with free rent for, for vulnerable populations. We've seen a massive adoption of technology during this period. Uh, recently, uh, there was a report there was more mobile money uh, transferred in Kenya than any time since the, in, the beginning of mobile money in 2007. We've started to see some of the region's richest engage in philanthropy at a more higher level, particularly in places like Nigeria and South Africa. Uh, we've started to see more jailhouse releases uh, because uh, being in prison means that you are vulnerable to, to COVID-19. We've seen a number of countries let out uh, a number of people. This is a, a long time challenge has been the sort of the, uh, the crowding of, of African prisons. And finally, we've seen a very assertive and effective African Union and a very assertive African leadership calling out the international community for uh, their response to COVID-19 in the region, for the challenges around debt. And I think that will be, we're already starting to see echoes of that around what will be the case with the vaccine. So I think for our panelists today and for the discussion, uh, we'd like to pull out what is going to be part of the new landscape in Sub-Saharan Africa, or excuse me, in Africa, you know, after COVID-19. How do we mitigate the negative elements of the pandemic? How do we concretize the positive developments? And I'm really fortunate to join by uh, some very smart thinkers on the continent. Um, and I'm going to go uh, one by one. Everyone will have, you know, a five minute or so intervention, and then we'll do a round uh, of questions. So we're going to start with Tedessa Kuma Warako. Um, He's the uh, lead researcher in, at the Policy Studies Institute in Ethiopia. Tedessa, Tedessa. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Joba. Uh, I hope uh, I'd like to uh, say everyone hi. Uh, it's an extremely wonderful opportunity for those of us living far apart uh, from each other. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, Jim and his team for organizing this uh, wonderful uh, African Virtual Think Tank Summit. With that, I hope uh, I don't want to say more, but who is really affected by COVID-19? Because ultimate aim of supporting and interventions should focus on those. So what has been done and who are affected really the victims of COVID-19, despite uh, COVID is affected, I mean, it's pandemic, uh, it's a different uh, and uh, non-recognized one in the human history. But when you come to down and see who is affected? That is very important area which uh, this forum or this summit has to take into account. For instance, a majority of the studies so far done in Africa shows uh, mainly those who are working in the low level. For instance, if we consider uh, uh, like workers in the industrial parks who are already laid off, uh, there are farmers as pastoralists. 
and households in the areas at risk, even in the normal periods, are really vulnerable guys. And also we have frontline health workers uh, working at bottom line for uh, all interventions. And also we have women who are living in the urban informal sectors and employed industrial park workers, children uh, going to school, which has lost for the last seven months without schooling. Uh, and also we have group of specific vulnerabilities, uh, which is like H HIV AIDS victims and also internally displaced peoples. So whenever we speak, I can list, but I hope this forum has to talk more. Those who are really victims of this issue. So that is one issue I have in terms of, uh, I hope uh, as mentioned by my earlier colleague, COVID has brought some, uh, so despite its uh, considerable costs and effects, negative slowdown of all the global economies, still there are some benefits, as you have said. And one of the good benefits is the consideration of this virtual communication, virtual exchange of information, virtual technology use. But this, is, this has brought really significant benefits, which we can uh, say. When we come to down, in addition to this, I hope uh, in Africa, uh, when we come down, agriculture is the most important sector. And any effect on agriculture has meaningful disrupting, disrupting effect on household level. So maybe one of area, how much does emergence on, I mean, the pandemic has affected agricultural production in Africa. Indeed, there are all sectors are affected, service sectors, tourism, industrial sectors. I mean, most of them are affected. None of the se sectors are uh, free from that, from its effect. But when I come to agriculture, I hope agriculture is one of the areas which is severely, severely affected. Maybe I hope at later stage. Okay, so I'm, I'm through. For instance, when we consider agriculture in Ethiopia, the production estimated to drop 30%. So countries like Ethiopia, we import large amount of food. When it drops 30% down, then you can, you can imagine the, its effect, how much it can affect the other households. So uh, these are some of areas which uh, the remaining colleagues has to take into account. At the end, I have one issue to mention. Human health matters. That is, a, that is a most important issue that has to be taken into care. And uh, in Africa, I don't know exactly what's going in other African countries, but in Ethiopia, there are visible negligences. People are nowadays, despite existence of this uh, pandemic, still people are re even not wearing these uh, important masks and others because of uh, standard of living and income also, but the still negligence is there. The focus given, the weight given, the attention given at the beginning of COVID was really eroded by from the government side as well. So that is an issue. How can these researchers or think tanks can really increase awareness of all the, the, the leaders and also these all institutions? It could be the government um, as well as the donors, whatever it is. So that 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 uh, awareness is really declining as to my perception. So these are some of the issues which I want to comment. Thank you for uh, this. Thank you, Tadesse. Uh, great insights. I hope we can um, follow up on some of these issues in the q and I want to turn to uh, Vasu uh, Gooden. He's the uh, founder and executive director of Accord in South Africa. Vasu. Thank you very much, uh, Judd. Let me try to switch my sound off here because there's an echo. Uh, Judge, can you tell, still hear me? We can hear you. Yes. Okay, so I just had to switch my sound off, otherwise it was an echo. Judge, thank you very much. Uh, I think you gave a nice broad overview in the beginning of uh, what we have been seeing on the continent generally, and I'm supposed to focus on Southern Africa. So let me do three things. Firstly, to say, what did we find prior to COVID? What happened now in COVID? And where do we think this is going 
uh, following uh, COVID. So before the onset of COVID, our own prognosis, we work in peace and security, was based on uh, uh, the, the following evidence that we found. Firstly, we've seen exponential population growth across the continent and here in Southern Africa. Uh, rapid urbanization, particularly into unplanned cities, as well as uh, economies that were not transforming from agrarian to industrial to information. So people moving to the center were literally moving to nothing, no employment, no education, no uh, health care. And that was a serious uh, problem. Uh, thirdly, a slowdown of our economies. Fourthly, a commodity crisis. Fifthly, climate crisis that was pushing people to the center. And so out of those phenomenon, our own uh, prognosis was that what we were going to see was the theater of conflict move to urban areas, whilst at the same time in certain countries, we will see insurgencies, uh, particularly in countries that are not in total control of their sovereign territory. And that was now pre-COVID. What has happened in COVID? All of that has been exacerbated. So the health crisis although as we know now with the statistics has not impacted as badly as we thought it would impact on the continent, though we are seeing a second wave here in South Africa where I am, and now we are seeing that in other parts of the continent. But the health crisis in and of itself has not resulted in a major challenge to the continent. However, measures taken to stem the spread of the virus have impacted quite negatively on the continent. So we have seen a, the health crisis precipitate an economic crisis, and we know the numbers coming out of the Economic Commission for Africa, the African Development Bank, the World Bank, all point to the fact that Africa and, of course, our own region will be uh, moving into a recession. Uh, the numbers are already there. And we've seen uh, a sharp rise in unemployment uh, across the continent, huge numbers of liquidation of uh, small businesses. And so that economic crisis, we know will precipitate a security crisis and the security crisis will precipitate a humanitarian crisis. So effectively what we uh, think will happen going into the future now uh, on the continent, uh, we have seen the African Union really come together uh, uh, cooperatively in, in uh, uh, building uh, a, a African response, and I think that will bode well for the continent and how we will deal with the crisis. Particularly, it will give uh, some impetus to the African Continental Free Trade Agreement because uh, we've seen, uh, you know, uh, cooperative procurement, etc. Those will be uh, good platforms for uh, the Continental Free Trade Agreement. So we have to do several things going forward. One is we have to keep that cooperation going and we have to see how we can help build all of our economies together. We have to work with the global community for uh, debt cancellation, not just debt relief, and for uh, further investment on the continent. That's on the economic side. On the peace and security side, we have to, of course, uh, ensure that we uh, build our early warning mechanism so that we can track conflict in advance and at the same time, uh, we can also build our preventive uh, mechanisms. And on the humanitarian side, we have to make sure that we have all of the logistics in place so that when we have a humanitarian crisis, as we have seen now in northern Mozambique, and we have seen now in uh, on the north of Ethiopia, and there are going to be many more of this on the continent, that we will have the necessary logistics in place uh, to deal with the humanitarian crisis that will come. And I think think tanks, we can assist really by giving evidence-based research uh, for early warning. Uh, we can give policy suggestions of our governments can rapidly move because we know that, you know, policy takes a long time. We don't have enough time on the continent. So we have to pool our uh, think tank resources in the different areas so that we can assist governments to develop policies and implement them as fast as possible on, on the continent. So I think these are, for me, you know, where we were prior to COVID, where we have been now in the envi COVID environment and what's coming on the horizon as we move out of the COVID environment. Just two quick things. The first is that, you know, research globally has shown that when uh, people come together in a crisis and work with their governments, 
as time goes and they find that their interests are not met, they use the same positive energy, uh, which turns to negative energy to mobilize against their governments. We are seeing that now on the continent and governments, of course, we are seeing correspondingly, uh, correspondingly using the COVID environment to clamp down on social and political protests. So this is going to be a new serious environment that, uh, you know, and a challenging environment that we have to deal with. So we as a court, since the onset of the virus in uh, uh, March, we have started the COVID uh, conflict and resilience monitor, which we produce on a weekly basis on a Wednesday. We've just finished, I think, the 34th issue uh, this week, and I put the link uh, in the chat group so you can go onto the link and you'll see our findings both in narrative form and in graphic form. So thank you very much, Jad, and I'm available for a Q&A. Thanks, Vasu. You put a lot on the table. Uh, fantastic. So we're going to turn to uh, Virginie Talo. She's the director of uh, ISRA, the Institute for Social Research in Africa, that's based in Burkina Faso. Uh, Virginie. Okay, thank you. So I want also to thank uh, first James McCain and uh, the things and uh, think tanks and the civil society program of the University of Pennsylvania for the invitation and for organizing this um, this event. So in Burkina Faso, uh, the first case of COVID-19 were detected on the 9th of March 2020, and there are now more than 3,000 cases in total and 68 deaths only linked directly to COVID-19. Um, to COVID and I think it's very important to make the differentiations between uh, the death linked directly to COVID-19 and uh, other deaths that have, could, uh, that, uh, have been um, linked to the situation. The virus in Burkina Faso has spread pretty quickly compared to other Afri uh, West African countries, and the government has been very fast in implementing a response to reduce the spread of the disease. So it was closure of border, markets, school and educational institutions, but also ban of gathering of more than 50 people, not only quarantine of infected people and their contacts, but also quarantine of entire cities where cases were observed, with the ban of public and intercity uh, transport and a curfew. And it is as helped to control the spread of the disease um, and now the measures have been uh, progressively eased. The consequences of the pandemic have, of course, been harsh on the population, who the last part um, lost their means of living because of the drastic fall in, of the economic activity, especially the one working in the informal sector, as in the whole Africa. Difficulties in delivering agricultural products because of the transport restriction resulted in increased even if the government has regulated some prices. And moreover, the purchase of healthcare products, such as soap, face masks, etc., has had an extra cost um, waiting on the budget of the household. And the management of the pandemic has also um, been clearly impacted by the security issues that Burkina Faso is facing with the Islamist uh, and terrorist uh, threats. It is both more complicated for the government to apply the policies that have been decided and for the population to follow them, given that their livelihood have been already badly impacted by these uh, terrorist attacks. The Burkina Bay health system um, is also challenged by the pandemic and it has been already strained by the humanitarian crisis with the uh, internally displaced uh, person and the security issue. On the other hand, lots of individual and collective initiatives have developed local solutions to contain the spread of the disease, be it low-tech, like a face mask, or high-tech um, application. And the fact that the creativity has been stimulated is also very important to, um, to underline. Two minutes for me. Okay. Uh, which is interesting is that uh, measures as were considered as insufficient, mistrust in the figure communicated by the uh, government has also increased mistrust in the government, but it has not impacted the election as much as in other countries. And uh, Taboret was re-elected in the first one on the 2nd uh, of November. For West Africa, 
um, what are the consequences? On short term, there's of course this high economic impact on the population because of the big part of people working in the informal sector. There's a higher burden on women, increase of violence against women and children, higher burden on the women because they are the one homeschooling, caring of sick people, caring of isolated people, and of their higher involvement in the informal sector. They are the core of their communities especially in spreading information and delivering care. And this should be seen as an asset uh, and an important point to take into consideration when designing policies. The um, destabilization of the health system, increase of self-medication, dropping in the attendance of the health centers, especially for vulnerable groups, topping of health campaigns, including vaccinations, more difficulties in providing medicine and in pursuing treatment for chronic disease. A destabilization of the economy, of course. On, on longer term, what are the consequences on security? Will it increase the attractiveness of the armed groups in these times where economic opportunities are shrinking and political options do not seem the most efficient? Consequences on girls. They are the one leaving school because there's no more money to pay for their fees. And they are the one uh, sent to work because uh, there's this need to increase the household revenues. The consequences on a protracted crisis, with a drop in, a, in a humanitarian funding because of the economic crisis and the reorientation of priorities, and because of an increase of needs everywhere in the world. Um, and also what is very important, especially in West Africa, is the demographic structure which uh, with its high fertility rate has to be taken into account when designing social, health and economic policies to the crisis. So all these considerations may uh, certainly need a regional answer, as Vazogondan was uh, telling, uh, it has been uh, demonstrated, it can even be uh, pushed forward to tackle all these challenges um, in coordination. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Jim, you asked so many brilliant people to talk with so little time. We have two more speakers to get through, uh, but we're so lucky to have uh, Kareem uh, El Nayoy uh, to join us. Um, I know I probably butchered your last name. I'm deeply apologetic. Uh, he is the uh, president of the Policy Center for the New South in Morocco. Kareem. Uh, thank you, Jude, and uh, thank you, Jim, for making this happen. Uh, you've been a great leader uh, in uh, spearheading a true community uh, of think tanks. Uh, I'll be very brief. As you asked us to speak for five minutes, I have one strong idea and two marginals or three marginals ideas I would like to share with you. Uh, the first one, if I take the region, you've been asking me to uh, talk about a little bit the north, north side of Africa. Uh, I think this is one lesson that I draw is that this is the return of the state. And the uh, countries that have been able to provide strong responses, being organized and capable of delivering complex services, and particularly health services, but not only support line for small and medium-sized enterprise, uh, you know, funds to support uh, workers, etc., have been countries with state strong and institutions, strong institutions, and I would say also democratic institutions uh, with internal debate and the capacity to mobilize and to make sure that everybody is behind the decisions uh, and with a strong and unified internal front. This is the first lesson I draw uh, from the reactions uh, of various uh, you know, uh, uh, countries in this region, but more generally in Africa. The second lesson is that initial conditions matter. Uh, and uh, having some space in the area of macroeconomic policies, which is fiscal and monetary policy, is fundamental. Uh, you've been following the, uh, the policies in this area in advanced economies. They have taken for the first time a strong, you know, a large place 
uh, in uh, in um, in Africa, I can tell you in Morocco, um, you know, we had some sort of quantitative easing, the, our, our own version of it. Uh, there are specific credit lines and guarantee mechanisms that have been put in place by the Ministry of Finance in coordination of the central bank to provide liquidity. So you, are, you have to be able to deliver on that and to keep credibility because it's in difficult times that you're able to spend credibility accumulated in uh, easy times, you know, it's, it's, you spend in crisis, you save in good times. It's the same goes for credibility. And I think uh, this is one, the second lesson uh, I draw uh, from, from this crisis. The third one is the importance of being able to have social safety net, uh, nets and, uh, and of course, the functioning, the well-functioning uh, health sector. Uh, Morocco is the country that tests the more in Africa by far. We test 17 times more than Algeria and about 12 times more than Tunisia. I think we are at par more or less with South Africa. Two minutes Africa. remaining. Sorry, sir? Two minutes remaining. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, uh, of course, so we identified man, many cases because we test a lot. And as you know, many of these cases are asymptomatic. It's about 90% of the cases. So, and I think now it's uh, vaccination time. Uh, Morocco has plans to uh, vaccinate about 80% of its population in the upcoming four months. Uh, so it's actually starting, uh, uh, starting right now. So again, this is a logistical challenge. This is a financial challenge. This is an organizational challenge. Uh, you have to be able to deliver on that, and you have to be also uh, be able to have a to have a reasonable state. Uh, it was mentioned by Vasu, not using this, uh, you know, in a way uh, to gain some political advantage and stuff like that. So in Morocco, our system allows us uh, to remain together around, uh, you know, around the tent, which I, an image I like to uh, uh, to give. So in a nutshell. To summarize the, the importance of a functioning, the state, the return of the state, but in a positive way, I would say, we have to, uh, of course, uh, look at it in the, in the medium and long term to where it goes. Uh, margin of maneuvers in terms of economic policy and particularly macroeconomic policy, fiscal and monetary, and the appropriate institution being able to, uh, to deliver on that. And the cap a strong internal front with the pacified political scene able to put you know, the, the population behind the crisis. For instance, in Morocco, we have been able to raise three percentage points of GDP via a solidarity fund. And the last one, social safety net, the importance of the health sector. I think every country should make sure that they have not a stark, you know, health sector, but a health sector that delivers for the poor, that is, you know, very uh, detailed, regionalized, distributed in the whole country uh, to make sure we provide the uh, inclusively and in an equitable way to all our you know, populations. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kareem. That was a great intervention, particularly I think we all have to think about what the role of the state and how the state is going to change uh, under COVID-19. Uh, last but not least, uh, Ufo Keke Uzodeke. He is a professor uh, at the African Heritage Institute in Nigeria. Sir, you have uh, the final word for our panel. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity uh, to uh, make a contribution here. Um, they, we were asked to, uh, to speak about the specific context of one's country plus the uh, sub-region. For me, I'm finding it a bit difficult to generalize too much because really in many, many ways, um, we have very, very diverse countries with very different kinds of experiences. And uh, yes, there are some things we can talk about uh, that may provide a general understanding. But I think there are enough differences to worry about pulling these countries together and trying to make a point uh, that really, uh, one can say, uh, truly uh, captures the uh, unique uh, specific context of countries. So I will speak as much as I can about Nigeria uh, and generalize where I can uh, do so reasonably well. 
Uh, one thing is clear for me, and that is that the impact of COVID-19 on the health sector uh, in Nigeria has been uh, uh, completely devastating. Um, first of all, this is a sector that had, uh, until up until now, uh, has been very poorly supported by government budgets. Um, we've always, uh, I think, uh, funded uh, these issues, health issues, very, very poorly. Part of it because many of the elite, uh, the political elite, but also the social elite, uh, have always had options of actually traveling elsewhere uh, to get health care. And so the it, it actually laid bare the fact that these facilities have, have not really, really um, been doing the job. But, but truly, uh, it's also important to note that the, uh, the average person uh, in the country uh, has been, in many ways, spared directly in terms of the health aspects. Nigeria has not been as heavily affected, given its population, as uh, many other countries, such as South Africa, um, uh, in this region. But there are still issues that we have to uh, bear in mind, and that is that for those who were affected, that they were usually basically on their own. There hasn't been, we haven't had a lot of testing in the country, and uh, some states uh, barely have one testing center. And if you are in a rural area and need uh, to be tested, you are not going to get that test very easily. And in many instances, you have to pay. So there have been a lot of social issues around this. But uh, given the, the, the of time that we, okay, um, the, uh, the the healthcare sector. Uh, has been very badly as, uh, affected. In terms of the social impact, um, well, the, the, let me uh, come back to that uh, quickly. Uh, uh, for now, the education uh, sector uh, is in really serious uh, disrepair. Uh, most public universities still are closed. They were closed before. They are still closed now. Uh, many, uh, in, in terms of uh, the uh, uh, the other aspects of the of the social context, poverty was already high before COVID-19. The numbers now are frightening. You know, in terms of what we are being told, the poverty rates are likely to increase by several millions. Some some are estimating between five to ten million people added to an already heavy or poor people. So the issues are severe uh, in the case of Nigeria, and I think um, in terms of the, the impact, and people are scared and frustrated. Uh, these things play out in different ways, in the way they responded to the recent uh, issue around police brutality and, and the discovery of palliatives that were being stockpiled by political leaders. So uh, I think that there are a lot of issues that, that can still be explored in the, within the context of uh, COVID-19 impact on the country. But in some ways, this is not something that is unique uh, to the Nigerian context. But within, the, within Nigeria, it is seen as reflecting the old corrupt system that, uh, that had done uh, uh, the the selling feature of the system, uh, of political system that we've had in the country. And beyond that, that many of the issues in Nigeria cannot be resolved by simply uh, pretending that we are all uh, on the same page in terms of what needs to be, to be done to achieve transformative change and development in the country. Do I still have time? I still have, have a lot of stuff to say. No, if, uh, I think that's probably time, but um, I think that was a, a perfect ending. We put a lot of great ideas and analysis on the table. It's now the responsibility of the following panelists and panels to deal with all of the insights we've put on. So Jim, let me uh, thank you for the opportunity. Thank our panelists and hand it over back to you.
Your your mic is mute. We can't hear you. I can't hear you, Jim. Sorry. Um, the it was an excellent panel, um, capturing many of the challenges we face. Uh, and as Judge said, it's up to the succeeding panels uh, to come up with specific solutions. So uh, the first panel is in an enviable position to be able to pose the problems and have others come up with the solution. Um, I now turn the uh, meeting over uh, to the second uh, panel and to Ambassador Erica Barks Ruggles, former U.S. Ambassador to uh, Rwanda and VP at the National Defense University and uh, the Wilson Center. Great, thank you very much, Jim, and thanks to our first panel um, for that excellent opening uh, this morning. I, it's my great pleasure to be joined uh, by four colleagues from across the continent um, who represent a broad spectrum of, of thinking on uh, the questions that we've been asked to, uh, to discuss today, which is what are some of the solutions uh, to, to the problems that have been laid out, that the twindemic, as it is called in the program of both the economic crisis and the health crisis caused by, by COVID. I'd like to first turn to Dr. Rose Ngungi, who is the Executive Director of the Kenyan Institute for Public Policy and Research and Analysis, KIPRA. Uh, she is also a former senior advisor to the Africa Group at the IMF, a member of the Central Bank of Kenya, and has many other credentials, which I will not spend time on uh, because I wanna hear from her. So uh, Dr. Ngungi, over to you, please. Thank you very much, Erica. I think I'm delighted to be in this uh, forum and in this panel specifically because uh, it provides uh, an opportunity to reflect and share ideas on uh, what we need to do uh, to avoid uh, the pandemic uh, manifesting itself to uh, a, a twin demic or, or the like. Uh, also to start by saying that the future trajectory it's not very clear without a vaccine uh, in sight. And I want uh, to focus more on uh, the economic uh, aspect uh, of uh, what would happen with the crisis and register the fact that um, it's good to understand the economic systems. Uh, for example, uh, in the region and Kenya specifically, we have a private sector which is badly hit. More specifically, uh, is to understand that it is dominated by micro and small enterprises, uh, whether it, whether in the industrial services or agricultural sector. Uh, and in this regard, uh, uh, when you have uh, micro enterprises that are informal in nature, without a structured channel for reaching them to cushion, it becomes uh, very difficult and uh, uh, it can actually lead to an economic crisis. Uh, secondly, if you look at the agricultural sector, uh, they rely uh, on small holders and uh, uh, remittances to supplement their incomes. And again, we find that uh, without access to purchasing the inputs, the fact that we have relied on uh, the small holders to food supply, uh, the future becomes a blink, especially when jobs in the city are drying up. And more importantly is that uh, when the private sector uh, has reduced uh, its activity, then revenue that flows to the government also uh, goes down. And without uh, inflows of external support, uh, then we find that budget uh, financing becomes uh, more constrained. And we know that uh, government expenditure is a very good injection uh, if you have to unclog uh, the circular flow of income. Now, uh, in terms of uh, what we, should, we need to do, I think I want to be very simple. Uh, and the first thing I want to put in the table is that we need to establish uh, a good platforms for dialogue between the government, the experts, and the citizen uh, so that you can avoid misunderstanding and build up of uh, negative energy. And this can include also through uh, social media. Uh, when you have everybody uh, at the same level of understanding on the fight against the pandemic, it becomes very easy for the citizen to uh, implement the interventions that have been proposed by the government. Uh, we also know that uh, the government uh, 
uh, cannot on its own provide the basic needs to all the citizens. And therefore, it's good that uh, there is a, a good understanding on how uh, to marry uh, uh, the controls vis-a-vis uh, -vis the opening up the, for some level of activity uh, such that uh, uh, we don't deny uh, the citizen again uh, participating in economic activity. And I see this as a very good win-win uh, uh, strategy for all. The second element I find necessary is to promote uh, cooperation and coordination uh, of interventions, both at global and the national level. Uh, it's not enough uh, for one ju jurisdiction to implement uh, interventions in combating the spread, while another jurisdiction is not actually doing so, and the borders are open. It's also not enough for one country, for example, to have the necessary kitty uh, for testing uh, in combating the, the virus, while another jurisdiction actually has nothing. So it's necessary that actions are coordinated and support is also provided to jurisdictions without the, uh, the resources uh, in order to attain the desired uh, results. Uh, I like the emphasis that was put by FASU uh, on regional bodies like AU, uh, playing a, a pivotal role, uh, providing a platform uh, that can be used by leaders, not only to share their experiences, but also uh, engaging uh, the experts and the international community in uh, seeking for support uh, in addressing uh, the issue. The, the third I think is important is uh, creating awareness uh, that uh, all need to take control measures uh, seriously and they should not tire. tire. You see, when the public uh, uh, sees uh, the situation as a new normal, uh, uh, they can continue with their economic activities, uh, but not forgetting uh, individual uh, responsibility. Uh, we have seen a situation where uh, the continuing hygiene uh, practices have seen prevalences of common diseases going down, and this in itself is positive in uh, reducing pressure on health, on health sector, as well as on the household uh, budget. But in addition to that, uh, it's creating awareness and providing uh, uh, facilities uh, where uh. public can ask for testing uh, so that they can take necessary actions in good time uh, before they are, we they are worn down with the, with the disease. Uh, then uh, the other aspect I want to also emphasize on is a strong and responsible leadership is necessary. Uh, for example, when uh, the leaders become good examples in adhering to the control measures, then obviously the public uh, also tend to follow. But when the leaders fail to, for example, wear masks in public, then citizens will also not wear. When leaders continue with their social and economic life uh, unabated, uh, then you don't expect the citizens uh, to do anything different. And I think this is a, a key uh, to ensuring that you are running behind uh, the citizens uh, towards uh, uh, combating the, the disease. Uh, finally, uh, is again re-emphasizing what FASU has brought in, uh, the role of think tanks in generating evidence uh, on a timely basis uh, so that uh, the policymakers are able actually to get information, uh, even real time, and they can actually uh, uh, put in uh, interventions uh, that are necessary uh, to ensure that the unfolding uh, aspects of the disease uh, do not have uh, uh, significant implications on economic activities or social lives of the, of the citizen. Thank you very much. Dr. Ngungi, thank you very much for that very concise and, uh, and rapid uh, uh, packed intervention. I appreciate you, you, you bringing all, all of the pieces that you've brought to the table. I'd like to now turn to Dr. César Flan Moquette, uh, who is the director of the Centre de Recherche uh, Politique d'Abidjan, uh, who is with us today, joining us from West Africa, Côte d'Ivoire. Uh, I turn the floor to you, Dr. Moquette. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity given into and to me to, to, to make a presentation on the COVID-19 pandemic in West Africa. As a matter of fact, 
I'd like to, to mainly focus on the different perspectives in terms of ideas or action that need to be taken to, to, to circumcise uh, the pandemic in West Africa. So in terms of economic measures, we recommend a provision of social safety such as nets for household in difficulty and for individuals likely to fall into precarious situation as a result of the pandemic. Uh, furthermore, a sound management of uh, sovereign uh, debt to, 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 to mitigate the risk of insolvency and a more flexible tax system for small and medium sized enterprises. In terms of social and humanitarian measures, recommendation will be focused on raising awareness on the reality of COVID-19 in order to, to, to ward off uh, the perverse effect of information of misinformation leading to disbelief. Also, uh, promoting respect for preventive measures and civic mind mindedness. Taking measures aimed at preserving jobs while reassuring companies. Taking measure measures to support and foster solidarity with vulnerable segments of the population. In terms of sanitary or health measures, reinforcing population testing measures, measure while ensuring timely avail uh, avail availability of results. Two minutes remaining. Ensuring rigorous communication on the usefulness of a future preventive and curative measure, particularly on vaccine which could give rise to a great deal of reluctance. In addition of that, providing the medical profession with a treatment that will motivate them should be a must. Otherwise, ensure rapid management of patients at, at risk while implementing rigorous monitoring mechanisms. Finally, um, um, it would not be fallacious to say uh, as the matter, I mean here the pandemic, is holistic, the solution must as well be regional. So uh, Western, West African countries or states must work in, in synergy. To, to, to fight against this, this pandemic. So thank you, thank you so much. Dr. Moquet, thank you very much for that intervention. It's very comprehensive on the economic, the social front, as well as uh, uh, the health and information front. So thank you very much for that. I'd like to now uh, turn to Dr. Gloria Tomoleke, the Acting Executive Director at the Botswana Institute for Development Policy Analysis, BIDPA. Uh, she is a uh, former professor at the University of Botswana, has worked with the M uh, WK Kellogg Foundation, has been a member of parliament, has been deputy minister of finance, development and health uh, at various times in her career, has worked with the ADB, and uh, we are very fortunate to have her joining us today. So over to you, Dr. Somaleke. Thank you very much, um, Erica. Uh, let me say thank you very much uh, to those, all of you who were instrumental in, in um, organizing this uh, think tank dialogue. We are quite uh, happy at BITPA to be part of this initiative. I will not uh, dwell on uh, the implications or the um, effects of COVID, as the previous speakers have already done a very good job of um, 
highlighting those and enumerating them. Let me just go straight to the policies and programs that should be implemented in order to deal with COVID-19 and taking the, uh, my country as an example of what we did and how we did it. Um, I think the following would be in order. The first would be the economic stimulus that government has already um, crafted and BIPA was in the task team that uh, assisted government to work this uh, stimulus out. And then one of the things that uh, has become very evident with this uh, COVID uh, pandemic is that it has actually worsened the um, economic gap between those people who were economically marginalized uh, before COVID and uh, those who were actually not, uh, or the rich, the rich and the poor, the divide between them has become more. So what um, has been um, undertaken, which I think is a very good thing, is to step up the economic empowerment uh, programs to make sure that those who are traditionally uh, excluded uh, can be included. The other thing is to streamline and strengthen social safety programs. And BIPA has been and is currently working on a study that is uh, looking exactly at how the existing social safety uh, programs can be streamlined and strengthened for higher impact. And then one of the big problems with COVID has been this uh, gender-based violence. Um, you know, this, this particular week, one of the measures that has been taken, which has been uh, quite good, has been to set up the special courts to deal with gender-based violence. And the first one of them uh, started operation uh, this week. But over and above everything, the intensification of public education and sensitization about COVID remains critical. There is nothing that can replace that. And I think um, even though this effort is ongoing and uh, everything is being done to try and address uh, this education uh, about COVID, there are still lapses here and there, and there are people who are not necessarily following the protocols. But mm -hmm. I think uh, on the whole, the results have been good in the sense that out of more than 8,000 uh, infections, we have had only 34 deaths as a country. So it means that there something has been done right. So what hard choices should be made in order to ensure that a second wave or worsening of the situation does not occur? As far as I'm concerned, scaling up of public education is very important. And secondly, this focus on social safety nets to ensure that they are robust and well aligned. And then the delivery of high impact economic projects, such as public works pro uh, programs and infrastructure projects, to give the economy a boost, while at the same time also paying close attention to uh, the debt situation to make sure that after COVID, we are not uh, inundated with too much debt. So what are the lessons? I will mention three out of the several that I had noted, because there is no time. I think the first is that the COVID pandemic has demonstrated beyond every, any reasonable doubt the importance of education in public uh, evidence in public decision making evidence 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 and this is what makes the existence of think tanks in all the different countries very important and we must uh, intensify efforts to generate the evidence and to also help to enhance the culture of utilizing evidence in um, policy making the second is the, the second lesson from COVID is that actually a strong state is not a disadvantage. We had heard in the 70s, in the 80s, in intellectual discourse that uh, you know the state has to be rolled back, and there was so you know it was blasted in so many ways. But only when the state is strong can it deliver on its mandate. And COVID has shown us that the stronger the state, the better delivery and the more lives uh, can be saved. The third one that I uh, wish I could uh, mention also 
is the importance of uh, rethinking the economic strategies and models that we are following. Are they really the right one? Because now this is the opportunity to rethink how do we come up with models, economic models that are inclusive, that are able to generate growth, that are able to make sure that nobody is left behind in our part of the world. And I think this uh, discourses should be led by think tanks going into the future. I thank you. Dr. Somalike, thank you very much. You've you've brought in a number of very important points, especially considering we're in the 16 days of uh, uh, the fight against uh, gender-based violence. Uh, very important points on on that, and I appreciate you bringing that that in as well as uh, your perspectives on uh, on rethinking economic models. I'd like to now turn to Dr. Gabriwat uh, Kabedu. Excuse me for. Uh, slaughtering your name, the Director of Research and the Senior Research Fellow at the Horn uh, Economic and Social Policy Institute, HESPI, in Addis Ababa. He has been a, a Senior Economic Advisor at UNDP and is the Dean of Faculty of Business and Economics at the University of Addis Ababa, amongst his many other credentials. Over to you, Dr. Gabrielat. Uh, good afternoon from, uh, from Addis. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, Thank you also, Jim, uh, for organizing this uh, series of town hall uh, meetings and also your first full uh, proposal regarding the T20. Uh, let me quickly mention three, four points. One is uh, the approach to health services. Uh, to recover in a healthy way, uh, as well as stay healthy uh, in the future, we need a preventive approach to, to health, uh, to public health. Uh, and so, uh, there may be a need to revisit uh, health systems of uh, a number of countries uh, in which uh, the emphasis uh, seems to be more on on treatment uh, and drugs rather than rather than a preventive approach so i think uh, adopting a preventive approach is uh, is uh, very important looking forward uh, and economic recovery efforts should uh, also prioritize um, preventive public health uh, as part of the support for future pandemic preparations. Second is uh, many African countries pre-COVID uh, had adopted development strategies and priorities. Uh, but uh, given the, the developments, this need to be revisited and uh, reprioritized, uh, focusing on those that reinforce each other uh, in favor of uh, sustainable recovery. And development partner support uh, also needs to be uh, properly uh, reconsidered and linked to that uh, so that it helps with the, the recovery efforts uh, in a sustainable manner. Uh, a third point I would like to mention is uh, some, some uh, interventions uh, in terms of, uh, well, interventions for economic recovery and revitalization. Uh, restoring uh, flow or supply of uh, basic consumer items uh, and normalizing, uh, promoting agricultural productive uh, input supplies, uh, replenishing food services and stabilizing food prices uh, is going to be important. And in terms of uh, the, the worker layoffs uh, and uh, income affected, uh, I think uh, the promotion of public works programs to create jobs and healthier environment would be would be quite useful. Examples could be, for example, uh, labor intensive recovery measures support the urban poor and the low income. Uh, this could be engaged in labor intensive urban infrastructure construction, improvement and maintenance related to housing, uh, roads, walkways, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, and then a green recovery public projects and investment uh, may also be considered. Uh, and some examples uh, could be, uh, for example, large environmental protection, uh, conservation and rehabilitation measures uh, to support rural poor uh, and low income people. Uh, this is usually done uh, using massive mobilization of rural uh, labor, for example, for the purpose of uh, afforestation, reafforestation, 
terracing and soil conservation, building of water retention structures, uh, small irrigation dams, so on and so forth. And this have been uh, successfully uh, practiced uh, in certain or in several areas in Ethiopia, and that can be extended and will be immediately helpful for the poor. These are all crucial for rural livelihoods. They can be initiated relatively quickly. They are not expensive, and hence they could be done uh, on a scale. And they are very important because they support consumption of the participating households and therefore help to address poverty, food insecurity, malnutrition, as well as children's education. And at the same time, they benefit the future generation by imposing uh, natural capital assets, uh, by, by improving the natural capital assets. But of course, funding is needed. Uh, and so here again comes uh, the importance of collaboration that was being mentioned by previous speakers. Uh, and in connection with this, then uh, one issue arises, and that is the accessibility criteria and procedures of the climate finance may also need to be revisited uh, to facilitate this one. The first point I would like to mention is that there is the usual argument of building back better or building forward better. This is very important, uh, but and but there are also suggestions that are uh, coming together with that. For example, there is the, the suggestion or the argument that subsidies, loan guarantees, and other government supports need to be conditional on environmental improvements and better overall resilience. And then there is another suggestion again uh, that debt forgiveness condition should be conditional on accepting recommended reforms. Uh, while this, there may be a good reason for this, uh, and they have uh, their validity, they are also raising uh, some a couple of concerns in the context of Africa. Uh, one is, obviously, countries may get challenged by capacity constraints to identify and design large green projects very quickly that can be eligible for this kind of uh, arrangements. Uh, the second is, uh, there is also the worry that whether this kind of suggestions and proposals are actually indicating the return of a uh, new form or of uh, donor conditionality on external aid and loans. Uh, for you example, wrap up at this point. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm just finishing. Uh, and therefore, uh, it's very important uh, that this takes this thing is taken into uh, into account. Uh, and uh, therefore, damaging and recovery for in the context of uh, Africa, uh, if pushed in the short term, uh, could be could be difficult uh, if too much emphasis is given to these kinds of uh, conditionalities. Thank you very much. Dr. Gabriel, I thank you very much, and thank you to all of the panelists on this panel. I I know we are out of time. Uh, Dr. McGann, I think uh, uh, there's been a, a number of good points about how think tanks could uh, uh, help with the building back better, as Dr. Gabriel Watt has, has said at the end here, um, and a number of, uh, of points on both economic, social, health front, as well as on the security front. Um, they have been raised, and I hope that they will help with the next panel. And I thank all of the panelists very much for your concise and very incisive viewpoints. Back to you, Dr. McGann. Clearly, this panel underscores, and the previous panel underscores, the collective wisdom of think tanks, both in dissecting a problem and, more importantly, um, building forward better through the solutions that are proposed by think tanks. I now turn uh, the to the next session, which really deals, and I've titled COVID-19, the accelerator, transformer, or for those who failed to respond, terminator. And in African contexts, for many years have predicted that 25 to 30% of think tanks will vanish precisely at the time that we need them, uh, not understanding and always talking about an existential crisis, and the existential crisis is upon us, and unfortunately, it is likely that while the global average will be 25 to 30% of think tanks that close during this period will never reopen, that the, the number will be much higher in Africa. So it is incumbent upon all of us to help our fellow think tanks uh, strengthen their operations so that they can uh, continue to serve 
and most importantly, survive so that the collective wisdom and partnerships are realized. I now turn it over, uh, this uh, task of helping provide best practices to Landry Singh, Senior Fellow at uh, the uh, Brookings Institution. Landry? Thank you very much, uh, Jim, uh, for the introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, depending on where you are in the world. So it's my pleasure to be here with you today. I'm always excited when uh, Jim uh, reached out and asked me to be on a panel or to chair one. And uh, one point which is really important, I like the title, uh, about the uh, COVID-19 accelerator, transformer, or terminator. So in a publication that we, we had uh, a, a few years ago uh, with uh, Jim and Monday, we were already raising awareness about the critical challenges uh, faced by African think tank. Uh, the likelihood of many of them um, vanishing, being terminated, and uh, some of the challenges which were identified included the funding, the ability to secure resources, and the COVID-19 pandemic is exacerbating uh, these challenges. We also have the challenges related to independence and autonomy. Uh, now that uh, fewer resources are available, a think tank may also be uh, at higher risk of uh, becoming concerted or doing all the work. The quality and capacity was also um, uh, highlighted uh, in terms of challenges uh, uh, faced uh, by think tank, especially uh, with uh, the rising new generation, the fact that the private sector and some government position uh, may pay uh, a higher salary among other factors, and uh, the, the final point that we highlighted was related to impact and effective engagement with uh, policymakers and the public. So, um, so those are some of the core challenges that we highlighted. And I think that uh, there is not a better time than now uh, and uh, not better speaker than the one that uh, Jim has uh, selected uh, to speak uh, about some of the challenges do you think that uh, the COVID-19 will be accelerating, transforming, or terminating uh, uh, African, many of the African think tanks? So the first speaker of the day is uh, Elder David Samuel, uh, President in Council uh, of the Nigeria Global Affairs uh, Council. Uh, Elder, you have the floor. I want to remind everyone that uh, if they could keep it for four minutes so we can have a second round, Landry. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, my name is Elder um, from Lagos, Nigeria. And uh, yes, like um, uh, Chair for Manuel said, um, I serve as President in Council for the Nigerian Global Affairs Council. Um, I would love to give you a little background, of course, before I delve into how we will be able to. I will say evolve our activities uh, with the pandemic. So uh, the need or, or, or the idea or the mandate, of course, to create uh, the need that itself uh, was uh, occasioned by the pandemic itself. Now, I discovered that early on in the pandemic, around March and April, uh, we had a lot of disinformation, uh, you know, out there. Uh, it, whether it was disinformation intentionally carried out by bad actors, or it was simply ignorance, you know, spread across social media, WhatsApp, Facebook, uh, Twitter, and LinkedIn by citizens that were not very clear on what governments, uh, you know, uh, uh, were doing. Specifically, I remember when the United States, when the UK were passing, you know, heavy budgets, uh, uh, palliative measures uh, in order to help their citizens. And of course, the Nigerian government uh, didn't have a clear cut plan uh, like we currently have, uh, you know, uh, in, uh, in order to at least help our economy or support our citizens. So a lot of this information, a lot of this information. And of course, it led me to a particular problem. I was problem. The fact that many Nigerians are not even aware uh, of what uh, their government are, are up to. Many of them are totally ignorant of what the government does. Many of them are totally ignorant. So this ignorance oftentimes is unwillful because it's not like they don't want to know, but because there's a lot of this information out there. And of course, 
Everybody seems to have a smartphone where you can easily forward either junk messages or fake messages. Now, this actually led us to deciding that, okay, we need to create a policy team that helps simplify in an easy to understand manner and exciting to read manner, government policy positions. So the first problem we actually set up, we set up to, 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 to solve in June of this particular year was helping simplify government policy position. Now, of course, because we live in a tech savvy uh, society, we don't necessarily need to go to a TV station or to a radio station. So one of the major things we did at the very beginning was of course to come up with an app design. We built an app, we built a website, and we started simplifying government policy position. So we provide objective insights and what the government does. For those of us that understand the government of it, we know for a fact that government gives us a lot of big English. So one of the major things we've been able to achieve all through the period of the pandemic and of course so even for the pandemic, is the fact that we dislike the technology to a large extent in getting across to over a million Nigerians across various platforms, utilizing Facebook, utilizing LinkedIn, utilizing Twitter. And the good thing is, real time feedback on either policy position, policy proposal, or policy programs that governments are working on. And I think looking at the way consciousness of Nigerians, you know, are, are, been, are, are working during the police brutality process, uh, protest, the NSAS protest. We know that technology will play a large role in how we hold our leaders accountable. So our goal within the council itself is to ensure that we don't need anymore to wait for TV stations or journalists, of course, to begin to ask questions. With using the power of our phone, using the power of app, using the power of social media, we can begin to ask questions, we can begin to demand our accountability. And I think that's actually what positions us uniquely, because beyond the fact that we educate, we also get to train and grow future policy leaders. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Elda. I think that is brilliant. You kept uh, the time, uh, and a, an important one you uh, you highlighted is proactivity uh, through going through social media, engaging, and looking for your audience instead of waiting for them. So now I will give the floor uh, to uh, Siresi, uh, founder of the Think Tank Africa Worldwide uh, Group in Senegal and to explain how his, uh, his think tank is uh, navigating during uh, COVID-19. Do we have CRC? Okay, uh, we will go to uh, Olesegan uh, Omisakin, Director of Research and Development of the Nigerian Economic Summit Group. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Mr. Chair. Can can everybody hear me, please? Yes. Yes. Oh, great. Uh, it's a privilege uh, to be on the on this uh, platform today, and uh, uh, because of the time, I'll quickly speak uh, specifically on what what has happened or what has been the perception of uh, the think tanks globally on the impact of COVID-19 on their daily operations and their core you know, call uh, him, and I will also speak uh, more specifically on the experience of the Nigerian Economy Summit Group, uh, what has been our story so far. And so firstly, uh, let me quickly talk to this uh, uh, recent uh, survey by the Ontin Tank organization. Uh, this, this survey was conducted in uh, 2020, and I think around April or so. And the essence is to gauge the temperature among the uh, think tanks globally as to what has been the impact of COVID-19 on their daily activities, their purposes, and you know, so many other things that pertain you know, to them. And it's very interesting when the question was you know, asked, the question was, what do you think will be the overall effect of COVID-19 crisis on think tanks in your country over the next year or so? About 60% of uh, think tanks globally also, uh, responded positively. In other words, the larger percentage of the respondents were of the opinion that the, the think tank will always you know, continue to operate despite the initial you know, impact of COVID-19. And, uh, and, and that, 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 that shows something very, very interesting because that also tallies with our current experience and what we've seen with respect to how we've been able to 
uh, innovate and come through the, the initial impact. And so uh, the Nigerian Economic Summit Group has an operational uh, model whereby we are primarily aiming to influence or engage uh, government policies in different uh, ways, either by providing evidence-based research or by directly dialoguing with the government or by also networking with government to get in other uh, uh, institutions or institutes that will be you know, interested in you know, getting on the, the, uh, what the government is really in, interested in doing. But two key things I'll quickly say has happened to, to Amitoros uh, during this, um, as a result of this COVID-19. The first thing is that we are now able to have a more operational and functional re um, resilience through innovations. And by the way, We've always been seeing innovations, not at something that you quickly go into because of the current challenges. We see innovation as something that you do by nature, because we know that every now and then there will always be some challenge for uh, think tanks, organizations, you know, to carry out their daily activities. The direction, the, the, the focus might be changing towards one direction. Globally, you might be talking about the oil price. Now we're talking about the COVID. So, every year or every time there will always be a new challenge coming in so we operate with a sense of innovation as a culture and what do we do specifically we always organize our summit which is the prime uh platform that we use to engage government stakeholders broadly on me. the way forward on the Indian economy and so what we did specifically was we have to go online we have to go digital this this time around and it will surprise you to, to note that we have much more participants. And uh, now maybe on the average, we used to have something like 1,650, uh, but now we have about 6,426 uh, participants globally who joined us. And that was able to uh, bring forth the clarity of our, our goals, the purpose of what we are trying to do. So, before the COVID and then after the COVID, we had more leverage as to how we reach out to people and as to how we reach out to the government. We also have the same impact when it comes to our research activities in terms of the focus, in terms of the frameworks, in terms of the agenda, and in terms of the capacity building. We have more people now who are joining us through the fellow. Before, we used to be very lean in terms of what people that are participating in the research and development. Now we have fellows all over the world. People don't need to come to our organization physically to, to be engaged. Now we get people engaged in different forms of, of uh, engagements, right? And the last point, what has happened is that we are now striking a long-term deal with the policy actors as to the new advantages or challenges that the COVID-19 has brought onto us. Now, fortunately, the government is listening to us. Now, fortunately, we are seeing opportunities to go to where government may not really know what to do next. So fortunately, we are getting more job to be done. And fortunately, we are getting more people listening to us and hearing us. So I think this is very key uh, when it comes to think tanks. We need to see this, first of all, as a random, as the opportunity for us to provide more evidence for the government and stakeholders as to where Forward. And secondly, we need to approach changes and innovations and wrestling from the perspective of being a culture so that we don't wait for any sudden shock, you know, to, aim to affect what we are doing. And that's exactly what we have done so far. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Arisa Gan. So it is clear from uh, your intervention that the COVID-19 effect is one of acceleration. Uh, um, with the importance of innovation, digital transformation, among uh, other factors. So let me now move uh, to John Asafu Ajaye, uh, Director uh, of Research at the Africa Center for Economic Transformation. John, are you with, with us? So I see that uh, John, that I saw earlier is uh, uh, is not any more uh, visible now. Uh, let me turn to uh, Moke Cesar Flan.
Okay. So I'm here. Vander, he's here. Yeah, go ahead, please. I heard it might you. be beneficial if everyone turns their video off, it'll improve the sound quality. Uh, Jim? Yes, we can hear you. We Sorry. can hear you. Can go ahead. You can go ahead. We can hear you, Moket. We can, you can go ahead, please. You can start speaking. Uh, we can hear you, Moket. Please go ahead. Should I debate or what, what do you expect of, of uh, me? Just to speak about uh, you are, just to speak about how COVID-19 is uh, contributing to uh, the um, uh, is accelerating uh, or transforming uh, your think tank, the Center uh, for Economic Transformation in Ghana. And you can be brief, a, a couple of minutes will be fine. You think that? Oh, okay, okay. Uh, thank, you, thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Landry. I, I just wanted to, to say that uh, the pandemic uh, influences every, everything, things, everything thing, because the question is very important for the world. and uh, uh, when I take the example of, of Ivory Coast, we noticed that uh, the, the, the consequences, the impacts of the COVID-19 are uh, very, very perverse and every field of the life are, 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 are very concerned by this, this, this pandemic. So as a think tank, we have the, the duty to, to, to propose a solution and recommendation so that the policymakers can, can uh, give an orientation to their politics. Wonderful, thank you very much. So I will come back uh, to the other speaker. So if we can have uh, Elda and uh, Olesegon uh, coming back. Uh, that would be wonderful. So, Elba, a follow-up question that I have for you is the question is related to the question of impact. How do you uh, assess uh, the impact in the current uh, uh, context, uh, where you have to adjust your strategy uh, with also a government, uh, given the uh, the context of the government in which you are evolving, Elda? He must have stepped away. Okay. So this chair uh, is empty. So we're let, this let, is a live event. So things happen. <laughs> you might oh here he is. He's back. Yeah, he's coming back. So <laughs> Elda, I was yeah, yeah good. <laughs> I was Wonderful, asking Elda. Was, that was a <laughs> magical reappearance. <laughs> yes. Wonderful. So Elda, I was asking about the impact. Uh, of your new strategy to survive during COVID-19. So you, you spoke about the adjustment that you are making. And uh, can you briefly answer the question, perhaps a, a couple of minutes? Okay, thank you very much. So uh, I think uh, one of the major things um, that strategy, of course, we deploy, and I, I didn't say this at the beginning. Now, beyond the fact that we get to simplify government policy position, uh, for citizens to understand and ask questions, one of the other things we also do on the other side of the divide is also to groom policy technocrats, policy leaders. So uh, at the moment, we have 85 policy fellows that are drawn from all over Nigeria. These are academic professors, uh, senior uh, academicians, uh, professionals that work within uh, you know, uh, professional sectors, professional industry, uh, both in the private sector and in the public sector. So part of what we've done uh, is, of course, uh, with, with everything we've been able to achieve, we utilize using the power of technology. So um, to a large extent, we've been able to drive the conversation around you know, what government does 
just by conversations on WhatsApp, conversations on Facebook, conversations on Zoom. So there's that consciousness. And I can tell you for free, whenever we get to objective, provide insight or analysis on what government does, you see the way citizens are always asking questions. Citizens always want to know. In fact, we had, uh, we had a number of policy dialogues posted online where we get to invite senior government officials, they come down, they speak, and this is the best part. Ordinarily, for you to get the government official to attend a physical event, it's extremely difficult. But with the pandemic, it becomes extremely difficult for you to give excuses on availability because we need your attention online for an hour, for five minutes. So oftentimes, they are always available, of course, to attend your programs, get to answer and ask questions. Uh, for me, I uh, hope, oh, uh, you know, uh, and I speak now from a long term point of view, uh, is the fact that we would love our government to be more open uh, you know, when it comes to what they do, providing enough data. Uh, I think it's one of the major challenges we have in Nigeria and Africa generally. Our uh, governments are usually very, 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 very tight handed when it comes to releasing data on a real time basis so that, that citizens and, of course, think tanks like us can analyze in an objective manner what they do. Oftentimes, if you ask questions, if you probably demand answers, they tend to see you as an opposition figure. But the truth is, we are not opposition, opposition figures. We love our country, and of course, we also want to add to our national development. Uh, wonderful, wonderful. So, my question now to Olisigan. Uh, so, you mentioned that about 66% of think tank uh, were thinking that uh, COVID-19 is positively affecting the future of think tank. That is globally. Do you have some insight for the case of uh, Africa? And uh, the, the other question is, what will you also recommend to other think tank which may be struggling uh, and uh, near termination uh, to uh, succeed as well uh, during uh, the pandemic and post-pandemic? Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, the data, the statistics said that, uh, that I gave just now uh, says about 60, right? And the survey also captures, I think the survey is uh, uh, widespread. So you have uh, almost all the continents involved in this. And uh, specifically, maybe we may have to check for the African uh, uh, space. But really, we can also uh, see to it that if we are looking at the challenges of think tanks globally, then African experience will be very uh, serious, uh, just like other speakers have already uh, stated in terms of what we are experiencing, even before COVID. And uh, now the COVID has come, so you, you can imagine that we're going to have a much more uh, a tougher time in, in, in dealing with how we operate or our existing model. But one thing I want to say is that there is need for African think tanks, and indeed all think tanks globally, to learn how to operate in a linear format. In other words, let's look at the lean model. Uh, we don't need to always go in sizes, huge sizes of people here and there building big buildings there and there, paying for this and that. We need to really move by focusing on the core goal of our operation. For instance, at the Nigerian Economic Summit Group, we discovered that during the summit that we've always been engaging with before the COVID time, uh, the need to engage the people, the stakeholders, and the government happens to be one of the critical challenges that we we'll always face. And so what the COVID-19 has also helped us to do, despite the fact that we, we started the idea of creating an app to do that for us, even before COVID-19. But the COVID-19 has now made it very, very easy for us to end up developing an app that can do just that. And you can imagine how many people are engaging us and engaging our policy issues, are engaging our advocacy through this app. This hub is now adjudged to be one of the best hubs developed by think tanks in Africa. Now you can have people log into the hub, ask questions. You can ask, see people going into the hub and knowing what the NEG is doing or what the government is doing. And people can start net networking. So my point is, people should start saying think tanking, not as a uh, building physical structure, but as building capacity. Wherever they are in the world, the moment the capacity is built, 
and you are able to leverage the digital opportunity, we can always do better, even when we're in crisis. You're, you're muted, Landy. Wonderful. I was saying that, uh, thank you for a, a, a brilliant presentation. And I see that John Asafu uh, Ajay, uh, Director uh, of uh, Research at the Africa Center for Economic Transformation, uh, is back with us. So, uh, John, you, we, we will finish in five minutes. So if you can have four minutes uh, to explain uh, briefly um, how uh, your think tank has adapted during uh, this uh, pandemic and what you recommend uh, to you. all tank leaders. Thank you, uh, Mr. I had a few challenges with the internet, but I'm glad to be back on. Um, so, um, thank you for this opportunity. The situation that we're facing, um, it's likely to lead to a lot of funding in the next year or two. Um, so, it's very likely, especially when we, we with regard to unrestricted funding. Um, so, we need to do three things, in my opinion, to, to be able to uh, thrive and survive. Uh, the first thing is that we must redefine our research agendas and work plans to make ourselves more relevant to the needs uh, of the times. Uh, we, we, even though this is a crisis, uh, it's also an opportunity, for example, uh, to, for governments to use the agency of the situation to make policy changes that will not only help in the short term, but also strengthen long-term uh, efforts. Um, so what we've done at Asset is that we've prepared a policy brief that sets out 10 policy priorities for Africa's recovery and transformation in response to the pandemic. We've shared this document with the AU and we have shared it with the Ghana uh, government's economic management team to inform country's recovery strategy. Um, so in this period, we have to make ourselves relevant and that also means that we have to redouble our efforts to get policymakers to buy into our recommendations through advocacy and outreach activities. And what we've done, as I said, is uh, we've created a high-level panel uh, comprising eminent former and current leaders from the private sector, government, uh, private uh, multilateral organizations, and other think tanks, which we've named the Transformation Leadership Panel. Uh, and this group has committed to act as champions of our recommendations and use them to engage with political and business leaders to achieve implementation. Uh, the second thing that we need to do in this period of, of uh, COVID and post-COVID is that more than ever before, we must put emphasis on closer collaboration with partners, sponsors, and other think tanks. Uh, collaboration has always been desirable, but I believe that it's even more crucial in these times for two reasons. First, uh, collaboration on issues that are more critical and relevant helps ensure that our work has greater policy uptake and impact. Uh, and secondly, collaboration helps us to make a stronger and more convincing case when it comes to funding application. Uh, the third thing that I believe we have to do in these times is that we have to diversify our funding sources. Uh, going forward, I think there are good prospects for think tanks to partner and collaborate with the private sector. Uh, traditionally, these haven't been part of our traditional sources. Um, but I think the private sector, if we can um, link up with them to obtain solutions to the problem that they face, I think that would also help boss our finances. Uh, another funding source that African think tanks have not, not exploited in the past is philanthropies and, and family, like such as family, family trusts and foundations. Uh, in recent years, this group has shown the willingness to provide financial support to efforts to address socioeconomic and environmental problems in developing countries. Uh, but to gather the support, uh, we first need to identify the ones that are aligned with our vision and mission, and then we have to make efforts to get them to buy in. Uh, so to conclude, my, uh, I think there's an opportunity for think tanks to do well, even in these challenging times. Uh, however, this will not happen if we continue doing business as usual. And so we need to redefine um, our work plans and business models to respond to the changing situation. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much, John, for the very timely. You respected the time. That is beautiful. So uh, just to sum up, so some of the recommendations that you highlighted uh, the broader, the convergence during this uh, panel is that uh, the COVID-19 uh, effect is one of acceleration or of transformation. 
And in order to be successful, uh, think tanks have to innovate, uh, to adopt a lean model, focusing on your core goals, uh, capitalizing on digitalization, building capacity, bearing in mind the imperative of impact, uh, broadly collaborating uh, with your peers, with other think tanks, uh, as well as innovating also uh, for fundraising in diversifies, diversifying the funding sources with a focus on uh, the private sector and philanthropies. So thank you very much for sharing your wonderful insight and you are finishing right on time. Jim, I give you back the floor. Okay, I wanted to uh, point out that uh, Elder demonstrated uh, that he is not only great poised, but in great shape. He was not for one moment out of breath as he ran back in, took his seat and began his presentation without a single uh, loss of breath. I would have been out of breath had I achieved that. And so kudos to you, Elda, in terms of your poise and stamina. Um, we now move on uh, to the next panel, um, which um, uh, will focus on uh, the potential renaissance that COVID uh, may provide us a moment similar to um, the period in the Middle Ages uh, that ushered in the Renaissance uh, because of the failure to deal with the uh, plague um, during the Middle Ages. And here we uh, are faced with a similar set of uh, situation where there's a failure in government um, and in conventional wisdom to deal with uh, the uh, current COVID-19 uh, crisis. I'm very pleased to introduce um, Aloysius Ordo, uh, Senior Fellow and Director of the Africa Growth Initiative at the Brookings Institution uh, to lead us uh, in this discussion. Aloysius. Thank you very much, Jim. It's great to catch up with a number of sisters and brothers from across the continent and elsewhere in the world. Good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are, and welcome to session five, panel four. The earlier sessions, as we all heard, and the panels have indeed covered a great deal of grounds. Uh, Winston Churchill once bemoaned a lack of attention to history, and we all recall that he opined that the further back we look in history, the further forward we can see. Uh, so, Jim, you're absolutely right in telling us that when the uh, uh, great black uh, plague uh, hit Europe and when it ended, it ushered in uh, the great renaissance, which, of course, was at that time the most unparalleled transformation in the history of mankind. It unleashed innovations in the arts, in politics, in culture, in literature, in economics and the transformation of the social order at that time. Fast forward to now, COVID-19 pandemics has indeed been likened to a black swan that could have very, very transformative effect in the world, already it has. This raises <clears throat> so many questions. First, will this time be different? If so, how radically different? From the entire world, for the entire world, and of course, particularly for, Af for the African continent. Second, what can think tanks do to ensure we are prepared for the next pandemic? Make no mistakes. Back in 20, oh, 2015, 2017, uh, we all know that Bill Gates had been warning the world of the likelihood of something like the current pandemics. But of course, we were all caught. Uh, uh, unprepared. So basically, the next pandemic, whenever that hits, what can think tanks do to ensure that we are fully prepared? And thirdly, how can we help to foster more resilient, responsive, and inclusive governments able <coughs> to effectively respond to future crises of this order of magnitude? To explore these uh, questions, I'm delighted to be joined by a, a very strong team of colleagues from across the continent. First, let's turn to uh, uh, Shamsuddin Yusuf, Center for Democracy and Development in Nigeria. Over to you, sir. Um, good evening here 
from Nigeria. I guess everyone can hear me. Can everyone hear me? Absolutely, we can. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, yeah, speak closer to the mic. Know that. Okay. Is it fine now? No. It's it's, it's not fine. Yeah. Okay. And we can okay. see you properly. So um, if you position yeah. yourself more in the center. That's better. Uh, that uh, and now it's better. It's fine now, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. Sorry, sorry I'm connecting using my phone. So, uh, <laughs> so um, I, I just to thank you first for inviting uh, Center for Democracy and Development to be part of this important conversation, and uh, to also uh, express some of the key concerns that we've been observing. Uh, since the spread of the pandemic um, as of this year, particularly in Africa. And uh, just to state um, that um, the, the, the current historically and the contemporary pandemic challenges that we've been facing is clear indication that uh, it's not just about economic stability or instability or political stability or instability or having a competence in technology and so on and so forth uh, could be able uh, to ensure that countries across the world won't be affected by pandemic. Uh, but rather, what can uh, that lead to is that um, using effective data, having access to data, and using effective data to drive conversation around policy interventions and how best uh, could, uh, can state and not state act or responsibly respond to the challenges created by the pandemic. Um, quite unlike in Africa, I think um, there are a lot of misconception around whether there's um, growth in the, in the number of people infected or not, or how best to address that is also about the uh, key challenges of economic and uh, political instability amongst others. But one thing that is also very clear is that a uh, pandemic came to create crisis within the crisis. And uh, that's quite obvious in the sense that, um, for example, in West Africa, uh, most uh, over 80 percent of uh, West Africans operate within the informal space. And uh, we also know that there have been a lot of spillover effect of economic um, impact of um, the COVID that COVID-19 created, such as uh, the rise of food, insecu um, food insecurity uh, in the region. Uh, we've also been confronted, uh, we have history, uh, we have history of uh, insecurity, particularly for the summer that's conflict. And uh, uh, violent extremism has been on the rise across uh, countries in the region. Sorry, can I continue? Yes, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, the rise of insecurity within the region has not also created an enabling environment for effective response. So some of these key challenges that are inherent within the African setting create uh, a bulwark for the government to adequately respond to some of these things. I like uh, some of the experience that we gathered during the COVID-19 is about the lockdown, which restricted a lot of petty traders to go into day-to-day -day trading. Um, there is no alternative provided because uh, the stabi economic stability has created a lot of challenges, which could not afford ordinary Africans uh, to go out to engage in day-to-day -day daily uh, activities. And uh, the, the crisis itself created a lot of challenges. And I think I uh, think uh, in terms of how to see uh, oriented research uh, as well as the kind of a Hello, Sam Shadin. 
uh, perhaps uh, perhaps uh, many of those others can mute can basically turn off their video so we have a, a greater bandwidth please go ahead something can I go ahead? yes go ahead okay, yes thank you we're thank having you. some challenges so, with the connectivity okay okay Hello, Sam Shudin, go ahead. Yeah, I think his network is off. Right. Uh, yeah. So, Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Go ahead. Okay. I said in terms of policy response, uh, um, engaging in uh, such a policy. Okay. So, uh, so Sam Shodin, may I suggest that uh, in the interest of time, uh, because we can hardly hear you, hello, Sam Shodin? Yeah. May I suggest that we move on to set because we can't hear you at all. Yeah. If he could email email his key points and we'll try to reflect them at the end. Right. Okay. I'm gonna send him an email to that effect. Excellent. Thank you, Jim, for that intervention. Um, if I, I think basically in the, the connectivity was obviously a challenge, but at a couple of takeaways very quickly. Uh, Sam Shudin highlighted the importance of evidence-based data, particularly at this time, think tanks. This is important to inform policy and discuss. He highlighted the uh, food insecurity and insecurity broadly in the West Africa sub-region. And of course, he also emphasized the impact on petty traders and the havoc that the pandemics is wreaking on the informal sector. So thank you very much I'm back. for those. Uh, yeah, let's move on um, indeed, and I'll get back to you because we really had tremendous challenges hearing you. But let's move on to Seth, uh, uh, Seth uh, Quizera of the Economic Policy Research Network in R Rwanda. Over to you, thank you. Thank you very much, Aroysius. I want to first of all apologize for joining the Bitrate. Actually, I was there, and then suddenly, I don't know, I lost internet, but I've been there for the previous sessions. So sorry for that uh, right uh, delay in joining the panel. No I'm Paul Seti I am uh, the executive director uh, of the Economics, uh, Economic Policy Research Network, EPRN. Uh, this is a network of researchers uh, here in Rwanda. What we do, uh, actually, we do uh, three things. One is networking, we bring together uh, researchers, policymakers, organizations, media to exchange on policy issues. Number two, uh, number two, we do um, research and then we publish research findings to inform policy making. Mm -hmm. We do organize annual research conference, like the recent one, which is uh, closer, is in the Feb, whereby we share the research findings. Uh, thirdly, we do capacity trainings. So uh, that was just quickly to tell you what is EPRN. And uh, then coming back to the pandemic, uh, at EPN ourselves and with our members, we are doing a couple of discussions in the form of policy debates, whereby we, if there is a member with a research document, research topic, we discuss uh, mostly, we focus what uh, at analysis of the, the, the impacts. Of course, some of us, they say there are negative impacts of COVID, but there are others currently who are saying maybe there are also some positive mm, results uh, from the COVID, wherever there is a situation, you might find negative uh, effects, but also maybe there are some positive uh, uh, results from it. Uh, by positive here, in our, our EPN discussions, we made like um, new businesses coming out, like digital uh, solutions businesses. Uh, before COVID, it was not easy, like, uh, specifically in Rwanda, to see maybe markets relying on uh, uh, digital payment, or uh, e-market, e-trading, e-commerce was not advanced, but currently we are seeing a lot of businesses registered in this uh, area. So um, as EPRN specifically, uh, we have a project, we call it Beyond 
uh, beyond corona uh, virus uh, it is like a project we have as EPRN when we have discussed with government authorities how can we advise businesses to recover whereby we bring like um, one successor someone who is succeeding in business to share uh, you know the experience to share how he behaved during the, the COVID and share the experiences then we call it to, to, to actually we call it how to form our business operators behave in the new normal in the new normal it is a new normal because the way business were before it has really to change so in Rwanda specifically the government put aside a program which is called economic recovery fund economic recovery fund and plan this is really a holistic program to help most important three sector like sectors like a hospitality sector and industry uh, to revive their businesses but as research as we said but there are other businesses which are not registered how are you going to help them that is where we are organizing currently discussions on what should be the specific attention to informal sector when you talk of formal sector, it's a very, very uh, crucial sector, sub-sector because like, it hosts over 95% of the, 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 the workers and it didn't even contribute much to the GDP. Now, uh, what we, we do discuss is like to show the importance, considering the importance of informal sector, those people, like, let's, let me give you an example. For instance, a group of women who are selling fruits just uh, with, the, with the retail capital due to COVID, specifically during the lockdown, they had to eat, to consume this capital. Then how are you going to help, how is the government helping them to, to go back to the market? So this is what we are like advocating currently because mostly the measures are there, they are good, but mostly they are focusing on those big, big registered companies. Uh, as for now, I think as Rwanda, Africa as a continent, what you need to do is to assess the impact but not really spend much of the time by like i don't know i don't want to use the word crime uh, by, by spending much of the time saying you know businesses die do whatever we can't work well whatever but you can maybe say what are even the opportunities from the pandemic what can we do even to to, to grow quicker like a country specifically our country Rwanda, before covid the gdp growth was really quick eh? But currently, um, of course, like uh, any other country, it is down. What you should focus on is to see what should be the contribution of think tank researchers, radio organizations like EPRN to help really showing the, 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 the ways, you know, of uh, reviving the economies in the general. So I'm not sure if I'm being specific, but that is what I have to say up to now. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Seth. I think um, those are excellent um, uh, observations. First of all, I think it's very easy, and all of us do it, to dwell on the negative aspects of the pandemics. And here you are highlighting some really, really positive impacts of COVID from the perspective of uh, Rwanda. Uh, for example, the intense new digital businesses that are now emerging. Uh, as a consequence of um, the COVID-19. Uh, uh, you also talked about the unleashing of peer learning experiences in the new normal, enabled by the uh, Economic Recovery Fund, which is a ex really, really excellent idea. You highlighted, which all of us, I could see people nodding, you highlighted the, the heightened need for advocacy by think tanks at this time and going forward. So we'd really, really like to thank you very, very much for those points. Uh, now let me turn over to our colleague, um, Winston uh, Muwezi, advoc of the Advocacy Coalition for Development and Environment uh, in Uganda. Over to you, Winston. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Absolutely, very well, thank you. Thank you very much, colleagues. I'm very delighted to be given this opportunity to say something on the topic that was assigned to this group. But first and foremost, to say I do, uh, I'm the Director of Research at Advocates Coalition for Development and Environment, uh, which is the public policy research and advocates think tank in Uganda. Although the work we do at times goes beyond the country to East and Southern African region, and that we've been in 
operation for some time and we operate in four main areas in summary we do work research and um, policy outreach on issues of economic governance peace democracy and security environment and natural resource governance and science and technology but let me also add that uh, beyond uh, being a director of research at accord i am an associate professor at Makerere University in the heart of Kampara, and uh, that also I have COVID-related responsibilities. I was uh, selected uh, in the 17-person team that advises the Minister of Health on the COVID-19 response in the country. Uh, that's besides uh, the things I do. Now, back to the topic that we are talking about here, uh, the aspect of of resilience, the aspect of uh, working in the new normal, as we have come to describe uh, the new situation occasioned on us by COVID-19. Now, one of the big questions in the topic that uh, was assigned to us is uh, to try and look at the whole issue of, is it likely, is it likely that we may have another epidemic in future and i want to dare say that it's very likely actually the world health organization uh, one of the addresses called upon leaders to prepare for the next pandemic and we need to prepare in order to avoid avoid uh, the future pandemics because we know how much covid 19 has battered our economies, uh, our society, and more especially, if you live around the mortality and the man hours lost and the economic costs, but also when you look at issues of morbidity, um, issues of disability for people who have survived, the social costs are immense. Are immense. And therefore, it is important to put into perspective and uh, look at the fact that although Many, many countries. Uh, hello? Two Although many remain. countries yeah, sure. arranged, those with robust health emergency preparedness infrastructure <clears throat> are able to act quickly and contain and control the spread of coronavirus. Those that have very fragile health care systems have not, and, and, and that's the reality. Um, but we also know from history, history tells us that humanity has already successfully defeated widespread infections. And I want to come out with a message of hope that uh, in the past, uh, the global humanity has run over smallpox. Uh, we had uh, polio, and then we have had polio eradication uh, and things going on a bit successfully, even Gini Wong was eradicated. So uh, I think humanity is ingenious enough and this challenge will be dealt with and in my view, will be, uh, it will be rolled over. There are lessons I think which are very important that I need to bring on the table in this discussion. Lessons from the COVID-19 uh, uh, response. Um, reasons for, from COVID-19 to prevent the next health emergencies or pandemics. One of the things I have already alluded to is that we have learned in this pandemic that first-hand, um, first-hand uh, how to manage outbreaks or, or uh, without tools stores and um, treat them has been that those countries that did very well were those that had strong health systems and that if they did not act, would have had a threat to uh, populations, especially those that are vulnerable. And uh, so it, it is very, very important that uh, if at an uh, African level, we strengthen our healthcare system, we strengthen our surveillance system, we strengthen our research that is predictive of what is likely to happen, we are much more likely to be safe in predicting and preempting the negative impact of any other future <laughs> pandemic as we run through this. But secondly, is the pandemic 
in the world likely to happen again. I've already said it could happen, another type of pandemic. Um, and, and this is born uh, witness by the fact that, for example, we see increasing resistance by bacteria to antibiotics. There is antibiotic resistance in many cases. Some of the diseases that were thought to be about to be eradicated, they mutate and appear in different ways. So we are not out of the woods, although we are dealing with the current problem. I think we need to prepare to deal with um, future problems. Every year, for example, up to around 700,000 lives are lost due to drug-resistant infections. Uh, so the best time to prevent the next pandemic is now, and COVID-19 will not be the world's last health emergency. I can dare say um, there will be others. It's therefore important to invest in preparedness with all government and also societal approaches available with the right political and financial investments, uh, human uh, humanity can advance health security, prevent and mitigate future pandemics, and even protect uh, future gener um, generations of pandemics to emerge. So it's very important to not to look at COVID-19 as the end. We will ingeniously perhaps navigate around it, but we have to be ready for the next bite of different uh, pandemics. But I also want to say that nothing beats community <coughs> empowerment. In one, the one more minute. One minute left, Winston. Yeah, one minute. Okay. Uh, what I want to say is that nothing beats um, community empowerment in mitigating future uh, pandemics. Yes. And I think as, uh, as, as a research community, as think tanks, we need to look for new approaches to strengthen uh, strengthen communities to be empowered, individuals to be empowered to deal with the, uh, the, 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 the dangers of, of these pandemics. So lastly, I would want to say that the time to start preparing for the next pandemic is now. Uh, we need to appreciate that with the changing ecosystems, with human beings going to live in a formerly virgin, silent, quiet ecosystems, you are entering areas pathogens and therefore we, we have to know yeah. that that is likely to open a Pandora's box and you don't know what will jump out of that Pandora's box. So right. the more we do research, the more we forecast, the better we shall be uh, in, in managing to live in the future. Although this generation we may not be there, but our our progeny, our descendants will be there and we right. need to think how to protect them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Winston. That is uh, a, a quite a rich uh, a number of takeaways very quickly. Uh, you called our attention to the lessons from history and you concluded positively that we shall overcome because historically we have, the world has overcome previous uh, uh, epidemics or pandemics, polio you cited. Second, you called attention to priorities to, to health systems financing in Africa. The countries that have done this well have been the most able to respond. And of course, we know that many countries on the continent, for example, are unable to meet the Abuja Declaration in terms of 15% of GDP to health financing. Third, you called our attention to the fact that the next pandemic is not a matter of if, but when. And then you challenged the clarion call as to exactly now is the time, not tomorrow, now is the time to prepare for the next pandemic because it might, right. it will surely come, if not in our lifetime, right. but certainly in the future. And finally, right. very, very important, which I don't think many people may have picked up, but I think it's important, the whole notion of drug resistance. Drug resistance, the epidemics of drug resistance, which is killing many Africans and in fact the world over which you rightly highlighted, and the need, therefore, to prepare is key. So thank you very, very much for those observations. Jim, if you don't mind, in the remaining time we have, because we did start a little bit late, uh, I just wondered between uh, Seth and Winston whether there is any likelihood uh, within the East African community that the think tanks in this particular one of the high, most successful economic communities on the African continent. Is there any likelihood that in the light of this pandemic, we can see greater collaboration uh, intra-regionally among the think tanks in East Africa? Uh, uh, set first. 
Uh, thank you very much. Uh, to me, uh, from my point of view, I think possible. Uh, you know, um, we theorized in the current uh, world when the collaboration is the key. Yes. You, may, you may think you, 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 you are good at doing yourself, but believe me, it's good to exchange and to learn from others. So uh, I think with the situation, with the current situation, it might be a good uh, opportunity. Recently, we, we saw like some of calls. Let me, let me talk like on research. Uh, we realized some of the core of research are from the institutions in East Africa calling for researchers from the region. So, you know, conferences, not just at national level, but at regional level. Uh, with the COVID, of course, there are some research topics whereby you can do research together. And even for advocacy, when it comes to advocacy, there are some issues which are at the national level, but there are also others which are multinational, which are crossing the borders. So when you want to do advocacy, like we have EPR in Rwanda, you can do yeah. advocacy for those to address those issues in Rwanda, but there are other issues which can affect the Rwanda from those neighboring countries. That's why Absolutely. I think uh, collaboration is possible and needed in this situation. Thank you. Fantastic. Professor Winston? I mean, he has nailed it. He has said it very well. Uh, and, uh, think tanks, we, we, we have very good ideas, but we are not implementers. We are not in charge of policy. We are not in charge of governance. And at times we get frustrated when we see our leaders, uh, right. our heads of state, bickering on non issues. But I think this is very, very important that the leaders in the region need to sit together either in the South African community or in right. SADC. We have different uh, groupings to talk about these issues. Yeah. Right now, even amid this COVID, for example, mm -hmm. it is a border in the uh, yeah, West uh, RFC, and it affects Uganda, it crosses to Rwanda. Uh, I mean, these are serious issues that we have to manage as a region, right. and, and we always carry and you put this challenge to our leadership. We, oh, we need right. to get above uh, personal right. bickering and deal with the yeah. problems of the day. Thank you, thank you. And uh, uh, Brother Shamsujin, uh, glad to have you back again. And um, I was just wondering, Nigeria, of course, my own home country, Nigeria is replete with think tanks. Uh, the same question to you, is there any effort in this rapidly changing world where think tanks are drastically facing serious financing and other problems? Is there any effort on your part in the country to do much more collaborative work? rather than go it alone in the new dispensation? Uh, I think over the years, what we have learned is the need for us to collaborate and unless different resources that are at our disposal for us right. to achieve the goal. Uh, working in isolation of others is not a norm anymore. Uh, the practice yeah. now is to see area of collaboration. For example, CDC, uh, Center for Democracy and Development do a lot of work around fake news and, and, and disinformation and um, uh, around politic, politics and elections and as well as insecurity. And we've been seeing, looking at uh, collaborating with organizations that are spe more specialized on economic issues to see because there's always a linkage between politics and economy and it's important for us to amass resources to ensure we get that done. And just to Fantastic. add, brief, we need just to, quickly. We need to close here, Yeah, sure, thanks. Very quickly, Shamsun, yeah. Yeah, just quickly, I, I think yeah. we need to, as a think tank organization, we need to uh, in, boost our predictive capacity. Uh, because uh, by uh, because we need to preempt what would happen precisely, mm -hmm. and uh, be able to provide an informed uh, response, policy response to the government. And one of the ways to do this is, uh, which CDD has actually been doing, is the introduction of um, technology. For example, machine learning uh, has yeah. improved the government's capacity to do a trained trend analysis of information right. at disposal exactly. and make more prediction and ensure that we adequately respond to some of these issues. Right. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Brother Sunshinin. I've greatly appreciated all panel members. I really would like to thank you for your insights. Jim, as you can see, obviously, we could use more time, but uh, over to you. And thank you very much for the opportunity. Yes, no, excellent panel and an important issue that we need to, at this moment, um, 
of uh, hopefully resilience and renaissance uh, that the suggestions that have made will be uh, acted upon. Um, the final session uh, looks at um, very clearly uh, the need, which I think you know I want to underscore in terms of the purpose of 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 this summit. The reason why we organize it is not only to raise the issues, but to create a sense of solidarity um, and to send a message to international organizations and donors of the vulnerable population of think tanks in Africa that needs to be supported at this critical moment in history. And the message collectively, in terms of all of your wonderful comments, uh, help underscore both the need from a policy standpoint but certainly the need from the institutional standpoint to strengthen and reinvigorate uh, think tanks in Africa at this moment of crisis. Um, and so the opportunity to report out on uh, the findings of the T20 and Saudi Arabia's efforts to reach out to think tanks uh, in Africa to make the T20 more inclusive, more resilient, more digital, more responsive, um, has been admirable. Uh, that will be carried forth by ISPI, uh, the T20 uh, host in Italy. And the discussion here is how can we bring the message in terms of the policy concerns and the institutional needs to the global community and to international forum. I now turn it over uh, to our first uh, presenter from um, CAPSARC, uh, Jatinda um, Chowdhury, who is uh, a senior research fellow and a member of the T20 Secretariat for Saudi Arabia. Jatindra. Your, your voice, you're muted. You're, you're muted. Uh, we may... In the sake of time, um, unless it can be resolved quickly, we'll move on to Paolo Magri. Can you hear me, Jim? Uh, yeah, a little up on the volume. And then Jachinder will work with you to get you, your volume clear. Paolo, please. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Jim. As, as mentioned uh, on Monday at the, the end over with our Saudi friend, as T20 chair, I will definitely treasure all the lessons learned and inputs uh, over the last year. We will be particularly helpful in a year full of opportunities, but also some challenges. Speaking of opportunities, it is clear to us that after the pandemic, the need for multilateral and global coordination is there more than ever. On paper, also the will could be there. But we cannot deny that the T20 will run into a couple of usual challenges plus, plus some new ones. The first usual challenge is to produce effective and actionable policy recommendations. The second usual challenge is the ability to be heard in the G20 final deliberation and possibly in the G20 actions. Then the new challenge. For some, the G20 is too large, too different, too diverse to be relevant. For them, we should go back to the G7 or move towards a D10 or D something, an alliance of like-minded countries. The message is crystal clear. Let's keep China and others out. For others, the G20 is still too small, not representative enough of the collective will of the world. These two views appear at odds, but they both tap into the same uneasiness with the G20 format. Be it a problem of representation, the G20 leaves many countries out, or one of effectiveness, acting by consensus is hard, even with about 20 countries. Clearly, it will not be up to us to defend specific multilateral formats, but we cannot avoid acknowledging that the G20 has been and still remains the only attempt to take a color photo of today's world instead of relying on a 70 years old black and white photo, the one of the powerless UN General Assembly, or on a fading photo taken over 40 years ago, the G7 format. With this in mind, 
we will do our best during our chairmanship to keep the T20 exercise as open, inclusive, and diverse as possible. This is particularly relevant for Africa. Africa will be central on many topics that will be addressed by the Italian G20, as it was in previous meetings. Take debt suspension, development aid, migration, renewable energy. But we have to admit that dialogue on African matters is often top-down. Only one country, South Africa, is included in the summit, and the participation of African think tanks, as Fahad showed with his data on Monday, is still very limited, too limited. So instead of using my last minute to present task forces of the Italian T20, you can find them on our website www.t20italy.org. I wish to use it to encourage you all to actively participate in our T20 process to help our effort to have African voices heard. Budget and pandemic permitting, we will do our best to invite as many African voices as possible and involve, with the help of Jim again and his program, as many African think tanks as possible in the policy brief drafting process and in all our activities. Thank you. The Tinder will try again. Um, still no sound. Uh, Chitrinda, what we will do is, um, um, we'll try one, uh, we'll go to Landry, um, and then, uh, what, if, uh, sound continues to fail, we'll, uh, circle back to you at the end. Uh, and if is that fails, can you hear me? Now, yes, wonderful. Wonderful. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jim. I'm sorry for the technical goof ups. Uh, part of being virtual, I believe. We live, we live on this, this roller coaster of uneven technology and problems, but we're, we go with the flow. So please continue. I, uh, I agree. I agree. Uh, so thank you, Paolo, for uh, giving me the segue to talk about, uh, uh, the points that Dr. Fahad had raised in the handover ceremony. And I would like to bring out a few points uh, that I had written down. So this was the largest T20 in uh, the history of T20. And we had 146 policy briefs, 606 authors, 438 institutions, 55 countries, and 55 co-chairs. If I were to compare it with participation from Africa, we had 37 authors, 22 institutions, and only 10 countries participating. If, again, I were to compare, Germany with 39 policy brief authors had more authors than the entire continent of Africa. So my point is that the African continent and the African Union, the new uh, organizations which are coming up in Africa, they have to contribute more in terms of policy briefs. Paolo's T20 uh, Italy gives us an excellent opportunity to represent the entire gamut of ideas that I have been hearing in this excellent uh, conversation today. The policy briefs from our collective research effort are channelized to the G20 leadership. The T20 is open to everybody. It is not limited to the G20 countries. It is open to across the world. And we should be envisaging how can we leverage the excellent insights, the knowledge that is available, and the information that is available to be able to channelize to the G20 leadership. Africa represents an, a huge fountain of knowledge, especially given the challenging circumstances that we are in. And that should be correlated coalesced and communicated to the world leadership. T20 allows that opportunity. And finally, I would also like to say that we have an, a huge uh, engagement platform. If it can be used, it will benefit everyone from the policymakers to the think tanks and to potentially donors to identify which think tanks to fund. 
everybody should be part of this journey going forward. Thank you so much. Jatendra, thank you very much. Uh, I now turn it quickly over to Landry to um, make some comments from Africa. Your mic is muted. Thank you very much, uh, Jim. This is uh, a wonderful opportunity. I want to first uh, acknowledge the brilliant presentation just before me. I I'm very excited to see the commitment to be as inclusive uh, as possible as demonstrated in the past, but also as a plan uh, for the future. So uh, uh, I, I want to commend that. Broadly speaking, uh, we have representation can happen in many ways. So one is in terms of a number, uh, which is important of quality, and the other is in terms also of impact. And as we know, many of the policies which are fr uh, framing uh, what is uh, happening in Africa are decided uh, outside of Africa. Whether we speak about uh, Washington DC, Paris, uh, uh, London, uh, Geneva, a Mount Order. So that is why it is really important to have this collaboration uh, between African think tanks and uh, uh, think tanks from around the world, especially from uh, the T20. And at the Brookings Institution, for example, that is one thing that we, we almost systematically include uh, many uh, African partners, think tank partners, uh, in the projects that we are implementing uh, because we deeply believe that representation matter. Now, let me speak about a, co uh, a couple of uh, things. So first, in terms of impact, uh, uh, an inclusion for a higher impact, which we have to think about four things. Awareness raising. So how do we reach a broader public through whether social media, media engagement, uh, amount order. So awareness raising is extremely important. People also have to hear about the African perspective or African think tank perspectives. The second point is agenda setting. And I think in terms of agenda setting, a lot has been done with the different briefs and uh, this work with the epistemic community. So how do we improve that moving forward in terms of agenda setting, the engagement with the policymakers uh, at the intermediary to senior level, but also with the uh, uh, think tank expert, researcher, scholar, uh, amount order. The third point is policy adoption. Once we have those policy briefs, how do we work with policymakers to ensure that they do not just remain briefs, but they are adopted uh, 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 by those policymakers. And those uh, policy adoption usually you engage at a higher level, sometimes presidential, ministerial level, head of agencies, uh, amount order, and having them involved during the uh, uh, research process, uh, the brief designing process is extremely important because they will also be more likely to successfully implement. And then the, the final point is policy implementation and evaluation. Once those policies have been adopted, what is the contribution of think tanks in improving uh, those uh, outcomes? I will stop here. I have many other points to make, but I will stop here first so that uh, we can have other reaction before I come to the other points. Okay. Um, well, time may not permit that um, because of uh, we are uh, over time already, but I would say a 30-second lightning round from Paolo and Jatindra in terms of their response and what they might add. Jatindra first. So excellent points uh, raised by Landry, and I completely agree with whatever he has said. My only limited point is this, that in policymaking, context matters, and the more you hear of policy briefs coming out of experiences, lived experiences from Africa, the more context that policymakers from a similar economic setup or a similar uh, e uh, economic uh, uh, ranking status, they, where does this context fit in for them? And that is what is important, that we improve the information flow of success stories from Africa for other nations. That, if we can do it through T20, that will be an immense win for everyone. 
Paolo. Uh, I agree with Jitendra, I fully agree. Uh, and uh, I take my three seconds just to reinforce my previous message. Please join us. We will do our best to, be, to have you with us as our friends in Saudi Arabia did. Uh, we will do whatever is possible. We need your voice. Uh, we value your voice. So a few uh, points in closing in terms of this um, uh, session. One, I want to point out that um, we should not miss the point that the first um, T20, G20 summit took place in the Middle East and that CAPSART hosted that event and moved towards greater inclusion. Uh, it, it demonstrates, as this meeting demonstrates, uh, the command and ability of uh, premier institutions in the region to lead um, the T20 and G20 process. The exceptional speakers today on each and every panel demonstrates the collective wisdom of Africa and the think tanks in Africa, and no. those think tanks must be included in the G20 and T20 process. The fact that only one country and one institution represents Africa on the T20 must end. The, Af the European Union with 27 countries is represented uh, on the T20 and G20. Africa is not. The Afri a simple, easy solution is to include the African Union. Capsart and ISPI and others in terms of Brazil, India, et cetera, Indonesia, are committed to increasing inclusiveness and the reality that the future summits will be ho hosted not by countries in the North, but countries in the South will help ensure an inclusiveness and a commitment to that inclusive. We must all make sure that the T20 and other international bodies consult the voices. If you look at those who participated, the reality of all summits and the, and the, the admirable efforts of CAPSAR to essentially be more inclusive does suggest in terms of the policy briefs and those who participate, a dominance of policy brief and participants from the US and Europe and the dependencia that is created must end and inclusion must be increased. And a commitment to that must be reflected, not only in terms of the policy briefs, but the international advisory board for the T20 in a meaningful, open, transparent, and democratic structure. Finally, that is reflected in terms of all of the panels is the need for a rapid response, a need to anticipate and know that conflicts are coming and that we must be um, agile and responsive to those conflicts. That global, regional, and national partnerships, which are demonstrated so incredibly here today, must be sustained and solidified. Public education and violence that unfortunately in tough times go, uh, affects the vulnerable populations, women, children, and uh, immigrant groups. We must be aware of that and help protect them. And clearly what is a looming crisis and we have over the last four years at TTCSB focused on what will be real both in terms of environmental challenges, but also in terms of the moment we are in, severe food and water insecurity and the disruption of supply chains that we must address. And so all of us need to be better, smarter, faster, more digital, more agile, as has been reflected in all the comments. But the think tank community, as demonstrated by this summit and the range of participation from North, South, Francophone, Anglophone Africa, and the great minds that are present and the great institutions that are present demonstrate that Africa can help lead and should be included in all of the forums, T20, G20, G7, et cetera, in order to make and consult great minds in terms of 
the policies and proposals and um, re response to the crisis we now face and the crises we will face in the future. I want to thank all of you for participating and joining us for this uh, incredible forum that is to serve as a catalyst for future action. It is my firm belief that it is not only ideas, but action that is essential and that we need to dedicate ourselves to that. Thank you all for a tremendous and insightful set of discussions.